So good afternoon, and thank you for coming here. Uh, so my topic is uh, contextual security. And uh, let me uh, start by telling you how I arrived at this topic. So if someone asks me uh, uh, what uh, research areas I work on, uh, I would sort of depict something like this visually. I work primarily in the large area of information security uh, with a special focus on uh, mobile devices, information security as applied to mobile devices, mobile users. But like many researchers in uh, information security, I got my start uh, looking at uh, the security problems in communication. So what does uh, security of communication mean? So typically there are two parties, uh, there are the blobs in green over there, and two parties want to communicate. But they need to do so in the presence of a bad guy. And security researchers like to call this bad guy an adversary. Right? So the goal of secure communication is how can these two legitimate uh, parties communicate uh, uh, even though there is an adversary present. And, uh, and security researchers assume a model for the adversary. Uh, uh, and the model uh, is typically called a uh, Dolevyao model. And that assumes that the adversary has full control over the network. Right? So he, the adversary can do all kinds of things to the, to the communication channel. So what, can, what kinds of bad things can the adversary do? Uh, well, the adversary can listen to the messages that are being exchanged. That's called eavesdropping. The adversary can actually try to change the messages or try to inject messages, impersonation or forgery. Or he can try to simply disrupt communication. And these are well-known problems, and there are well-known solutions to these, uh, typically from cryptography or from distributed systems. So for example, uh, the messages can be encrypted uh, as a way of providing them with confidentiality. And that would prevent the attacker from being able to eavesdrop what's going on in the communication channel. Similarly, the messages can be signed using digital signature mechanisms, and that would resist any attempt at uh, impersonation or forgery. So one could ask the question that uh, if we know um, how to apply um, uh, cryptographic techniques and distributed systems techniques, uh, are we done? Do we have, do we know how to do a secure communication in this case? And whenever someone asks a rhetorical question like this, you know that the answer is no. Right? And the answer is no, not, not just because uh, uh, that we have solved all, all problems in cryptography, but rather because if you remember in the beginning I told you that the adversary model assumes that the adversary has full control of the communication channel. But it also implicitly assumes that the endpoints are secure. The endpoints, that means that the devices or the computers that the users use are uh, uh, not compromised by the attacker. But we all know that in real life that's not so. Right? Uh, uh, there could be uh, viruses on your computers or other kinds of ways for the attacker to take over your uh, your devices. So if you have endpoints that are compromised, then all, uh, all the cryptography in the world isn't actually going to give you secure communication. Uh, a well-known uh, professor uh, in information security called Gene Spafford uh, put it like this, that the inf uh, encryption on the internet today is like arranging an armored car uh, with heavy protection to transfer sensitive information like credit card information from someone living in a park bench uh, in a cardboard box to someone living in a park bench. So in other words, uh, in order to truly get uh, uh, secure communication, uh, one needs to worry about uh, securing not only the communication channel, but also the endpoints. Um, so securing endpoints means uh, using hardware security techniques, using operating system security techniques. And uh, this has formed a large part of my research in the, in the last 10 years or so. One example of this, um, is a, a project called Onboard Credentials that I led when I was at Nokia, uh, which tries to use hardware security on mobile devices uh, to, to secure communication and secure applications. So one can again ask the question that if you know uh, how to uh, secure communication using cryptography, and if you know how to secure endpoints using uh, platform security or hardware security, or operating system security techniques, are we done? Um, typically, not always, but typically, the, the uh, reason for secure communication is because there are people at the ends of these communication channels. And people have limitations, cognitive limitations. So any security mechanism that tries to stretch people beyond these cognitive limitations runs the risk of being perceived as unusable or hard to use. And uh, already 100 years ago, um, a French cryptographer called uh, Auguste Kerkhoffs speculated that this security and usability might be contradictory goals. 
And uh, uh, this has actually been the common uh, uh, um, sentiment even among security researchers that security, usability, and other factors like deployability, these are all mutually contradictory terms. Uh, fortunately, in the last decade or so, uh, the thinking has started to change. And uh, uh, people have had to reason that if uh, the system is designed properly, it can be secure and usable at the same time. More importantly, uh, a usable system uh, will, will ca cause less confusion and therefore more likely to be secure. The dual of that is that if a system is hard to understand and hard to use, we might actually undermine the security of this system as, as a whole. And you can relate to this, for example, if your IT department asks you to change passwords every six months and imposes rules on you how you should choose your password, you probably devise strategies to work around that. Right? So writing down the password on a piece of paper, paper or devising strategies to sort of slightly change the password. And these have the effect of undermining the security as a, as a whole. So my first exp exposure to uh, the need for designing systems that are both secure and usable came in the context of uh, what's called uh, uh, pairing in Bluetooth devices. If you have used a Bluetooth, uh, a Bluetooth headset with a Bluetooth phone, you know the, the process of pairing. And something that we uh, developed is, is now deployed in, uh, in, in pretty much any Bluetooth device. So the question is, how does one go about uh, balancing security and, and uh, usability? Uh, this is a hard problem. And uh, that brings me to today's topic of contextual security. So my thesis, uh, and, and uh, I'm not alone in believing that, but there are, there are other researchers around the world who think this too, that Usability and uh, one way to improve usability and security simultaneously is by exploiting contextual cues. So by contextual cues, for example, in the case of mobile devices, I mean things like uh, 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 using the sensors on a mobile device to try to get inf information about the environment that the mobile device in, is in. And that's an example of an environmental context. And there can be other kinds of context as well. So let me give you two examples of how to use context information to improve usability while still preserving security. So the first example is uh, the so-called idle screen device lock. So mobile devices are portable, and uh, the portability also makes them inherently prone to loss or theft. Right? You might forget your mobile device somewhere, or somebody might, might uh, filch it off of your pocket. Right? Um, and on, on the other hand, mobile devices have valuable information. So one way to protect against uh, uh, this uh, loss or theft is to use these idle screen device locks. So if you use idle screen device locks, you know that uh, after a period of idle time, the device would lock. And before you can use your mobile device again, you have to unlock it by typing a password or, or doing other, some other kind of process. Uh, and this is, uh, for those of you who have used it, you know that this is a, uh, not exactly a usable mechanism. People actually dislike this a lot because if you wake up in the morning before you, have to, you can make a call, you have to type in a password. Or if it's freezing outside, you have to type in a password. As a result, uh, uh, there have been studies that said that, uh, that found that uh, most people actually don't use these uh, uh, protection mechanisms. On the other hand, if you have more and more sensitive things on your mobile device, not using a protection mechanism is actually very dangerous. So the question is, how can we design an idle screen device lock mechanism that is more acceptable to users without compromising security? So one way to do that would be to um, uh, make this uh, device lock depend on the context, make it context sensitive. So for example, the, rather than having fixed configuration of a fixed timeout or a fixed way of unlocking the device, you can make it uh, adjust to the context. So think about your daily life. You spend some time uh, in a place like home, which is very familiar to you, and it's also stable in terms of what other devices you find. You might, spend, uh, you might spend some other time in places like a bus stop, which is uh, unfamiliar to you and, and very volatile in terms of things that come and go. And there might be places in between. And if your device could figure out which of these contexts it's in, uh, it could, for example, choose a rather relaxed long time out when, it's, uh, when the device is in a safe place, uh, safe or familiar to the user. And, and on the other hand, it can lock quickly if the device is in an in a unfamiliar place. It can also change the way you unlock the device. In a, in a safe place, the unlocking can be rather easy for the user because the risks are lower, whereas in an unsafe place, it can, be, uh, uh, it can require more from the user. So how can we go about let, making your device understand the context that the device is in? Uh, this is where this context uh, uh, sensing the aspect comes in. 
that there are uh, sensors that are commonly available on mobile devices and computers, and we can use these sensors to uh, enable the device to get an idea of the context it's in. Right? So in, a, in, a, in other words, we want to estimate the familiarity of a context for the user. And you can think of a familiarity of a device for a user as a probability. What's the probability that I'm going to encounter a certain device like my phone when I'm in a certain context like my work? And if we can associate the probability or familiarity with the device, we can also estimate the familiarity of a context as a whole in terms of these device familiarities. And in our experiments, we found that uh, we can actually determine uh, distinguish between these contexts rather, rather quickly within about a day of use. Uh, so a familiar place will become, uh, will get a high uh, familiarity value rather quickly, whereas an unfamiliar or strange place will, will uh, stay at low, low enough values. So in other words, we could use this as a way to, um, no, this, okay, as a way to uh, make this configuration adaptive by making uh, uh, the device sense this uh, context values. So this is something that we have been doing for a couple of years. Let me give you another example, uh, and this is called zero interaction authentication. So zero interaction authentication are systems like uh, passive keyless entry and start, which is something that you can buy for cars today. And this is a system where your car can detect the presence of your car key nearby and can unlock the car without you having to do anything. And this is an example of making a security system easy to use, right? So if you, if you have ever rushed in a, to your car with your hands full of groceries and two kids in tow, you know the value of uh, being able to open the car without having to do anything. Uh, and, and in any kind of zero interaction system, there's a, a verifier, which is the car. There's a prover, which is the key. And the verifier senses the presence of a prover using some lo local channel like Bluetooth or some other radio channel. Uh, there are other examples of such, such systems as well. So uh, one other example is an open source project called uh, Blue Proximity, which you can install on your computer and uh, teach the computer that, uh, to, or pair your computer with your mobile device. Thereafter, whenever your mobile device is nearby, your computer will unlock without you having to type a password. Uh, but then by the same token, if you walk through the door, uh, your computer will detect that your, your phone is uh, not nearby and lock itself automatically. So this is, again, an easy-to-use security mechanism. The downside is that these easy-to-use security mechanisms, like zero interaction authentication, are also vulnerable to uh, uh, certain kinds of attacks, in particular attack uh, known as relay attacks. So this is where if the, uh, if the phone, which is a prover, and the verifier, which is a computer, even if they are far away, the attacker, remember the dollar Yao attacker that I told you about who can you has full, who has full control over the communication channel, can just simply relay messages back and forth and, uh, and make the verifier believe that uh, the prover is in fact nearby. So one way to defend against uh, this kind of relay attacks is to make use of the fact that if the prover and verifier are in fact in the same place, they should be able to see the same context, see the same environment around them. Okay? And if they, if, they can, if they see the same environment, the prover can sort of uh, encapsulate this environment in some kind of digital form, send it uh, via a secure channel to the verifier, the verifier can compare that they are the same. Okay, so what kind of, uh, uh, what are the ways of uh, encapsulating this environment? Uh, one, once again, we can use these uh, commonly available sensors to capture information like electromagnetic information, the Wi-Fi devices nearby, the Bluetooth device nearby, and so on or acoustic information, the kind of uh, ambient audio that we, one hears in a certain environment, or even physical uh, factors like temperature, humidity, and pressure. And once again, in our experiments, we found that even though single modalities like this are not very robust, uh, combining them uh, generally tend to improve the, the uh, security. Uh, so this is, again, one way of uh, using uh, context information to improve security of a system that's intended to be easy to use. Uh, and, and this is uh, uh, something that we are doing right now as well. So I gave you two examples. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, research issues that are cut across. I won't go through all of these, but I'll just give you about, uh, uh, tell a little bit about one specific uh, uh, open research issue, which is what's the adversary model for this kind of uh, uh, solution? So, uh, in, in both of these examples that you saw, we borrowed techniques from machine learning and context modeling. Right? So in those uh, domains, typically, uh, one argues about the performance or correctness of a system 
by considering only benign failures. They don't consider failures that are due to an adversary. Somebody, another human that's actually trying to actively attack the system. So for example, if somebody is designing a face recognition system, they would argue that the face recognition system is uh, performing well if uh, you know, the system won't uh, mistake my face for Ilka's face. Uh, but that's an example of a benign failure because an attacker is not going to follow the rules. An attacker is not going to use his own face to break the system, but might use a mask or might use whatever. We don't know what, uh, uh, there is no limit to the ingenu ingenuity of the attacker. So the right way to characterize an attacker would be to uh, design a, or, or specify a model that is both rigorous but also realistic. And this is really an open question. Like I said, the Dolevia model that we saw earlier simply falls short. Uh, I won't talk about uh, other uh, uh, similar issues, but uh, suffice to say that there are several other issues like this that cut across, uh, including the ones that how do we generalize from these point problems to some kind of a general model. So before I close, I, in the beginning I said that uh, uh, my area is information security, and uh, in this day and age, if someone talks about information security, uh, they have to address this uh, elephant in the room. An elephant in the room is this, this gentleman. If you have been reading news, you know that uh, the revelations that were made by Edward Snowden during the past year are serious and, uh, and uh, has uh, profound consequences to the profession as a whole. Some of them were known and suspected, like the fact that uh, uh, certain agencies had uh, uh, capabilities for surveillance. Uh, some of them, uh, for example, the fact that uh, standards, the open standards post process may have been manipulated came as a surprise to many people. So, so you might uh, uh, wonder or ask, what has this uh, got to do with the kinds of research that I was proposing? And I want to leave you with two thoughts on this. The first is that uh, um, even before Snowden revelations uh, uh, became public, there were serious security problems for ordinary people. Like how does your grandmother avoid falling victim to a Nigerian scam mail? Uh, how does a little kid use Facebook properly? Those problems haven't gone away. So uh, I claim, I posit that uh, it doesn't make sense that everybody starts working on uh, anti-surveillance measures. We have to also take care of uh, uh, this kind of issues, uh, both from a community perspective, but also from a national perspective. Uh, the second thing is that one reason why surveillance was successful was because even the simple mechanisms that I told you earlier were hard to use, and most people were not using them. And, and this has uh, started to be realized and uh, uh, even those who want to sort of uh, work against surveillance are actually trying to make secure systems more usable so that ordinary people will use them. So with that, I will uh, uh, leave you with the, uh, the, the, the thesis that I put at the beginning, that uh, usability and security can be uh, simultaneously improved by making use of context information. And my intent is to uh, start from these uh, sort of baby steps that I showed you before and, and actually make a, build a research program here at Alto. Thank you.